This is a production of PBS Charlotte. This weekend off the record, another walkout coming to local schools. Only this time, it's not the students skipping class, it's the teachers. Why they're planning to stay home and what happens to your kids that day. Also, CMS and the town of Matthews still talking, still arguing really, over a plan for new charter schools. What do parents think? Charlotte makes its pitch for the Republican National Convention. We'll talk about who we're competing with and also who we're not competing with. And we'll preview next week's most talked about primary elections for Congress, for Sheriff, for District Attorney. Off the Record's next on PBS Charlotte. Hi, I'm Jeff Sonier. This is Off the Record, where we talk about the stories you've been talking about this week. And if you watch the news, read the news, or listen to the news, you'll recognize the names and the faces around our table this time around. We've got Dedrick Russell from WBTV and Mark Becker from WSOC-TV. Also, Jim Morrow from the Charlotte Observer and Kirsten Garris from Spectrum News. Thanks for joining us this morning. Thank you for joining us this week. And uh, let's talk first about what we seem to talk about every week, and that's the schools. Um, walkouts have, are, have not been unusual this school year, in particular student walkouts regarding uh, gun control and that sort of thing, but now we're hearing about a teacher walkout coming in a couple of weeks over, I guess, uh, increased salaries. And um, uh, it raises a lot of questions about what happens on that particular school day and I guess the effectiveness of uh, teachers leaving their job for a day and how that would impact parents and lawmakers who make those decisions. Who wants to start? Well, I talked to the president of the Charlotte Mecklenburg Association of Educators, um, Erlene Lai, and she's we're asking teachers to take a personal day mm -hmm. on May 16th. They're fighting for um, teacher pay, um, more money to educate students. Um, they're, they're concerned about higher health care costs, and one-fourth of young people in North Carolina live in poverty, and they want state lawmakers to do something. Um, teachers say that students had their moment in the spotlight when they marched against gun violence. You know, women had their march for the Me Too movement movement and so they say now teachers this is their time to shine and let people know that enough is enough so they're asking for a personal day on May 16th and the schools in Durham they've already closed because they are expecting that a bunch of teachers will walk out and not be there in school so yeah, I read a thousand teachers have signed up for that day off on, uh, on the, the particular walkout day, which by the way coincides with the return of the General Assembly. So exactly. obviously it's a message that they're aiming primarily to the, towards the lawmakers in Raleigh who ultimately will make the decision on whether they get pay raises or not. Exactly, and on top of that, it's worth noting that this is really a, this is personal because those teachers have to pay $50 right. or they lose $50 for their next paycheck by taking that personal day. So it's more than just taking a day off to walk and march. They're like, we're paying to show up at the state house to make sure our voices are heard. And then Charlotte, I know I also talked with Erlene, she mentioned that they filled up at least almost three buses of 45 mm -hmm. people. So that's, a you know, more than 100 folks here from Charlotte who want to go. I know CMS School Board Chair Mary McCray says they will not be canceling class. So Charlotte's kids will still have school on May 16th. She said they are going to find as many substitutes as possible. And if need be, they'll go to central office and bring yeah. some people in. So Mary McCray says if it's elementary school, yeah. she'll be back in the classroom. Yeah, she's day. the school board chairman and a former teacher herself. So you may see a lot of uh, fresh faces or maybe old faces in the classroom. Exactly. You know, it's, really, it's really remarkable. I mean, this is a national issue. I mean, right. and mm -hmm. teachers have gone on strike or walked out in, in West Virginia, Oklahoma, um, in Arizona. The governor Kentucky. just signed some legislation to give mm -hmm. them a 20% raise. So that's, that's pretty remarkable for teachers to take actions, and those are a lot of red states. Well, uh, and, and the other thing is, again, because we are in a, that sort of global environment now where something happens, uh, we hear about it around, around the country and around the world, I don't think too many people really have a problem with teachers walking out that day and making a statement. I mean, in, in, in the environment we're in, um, I, I think Mary McRae or uh, officials at CMS may go, oh, we want you in class, but you got to go, you know, yeah. we're, we're okay. We'll, we'll make it work. Um, so I, I think it's sort of a, you know, I would be surprised if anybody really raises their hand and goes, and I talked to the superintendent, Clayton Wilcox, about this, and he says that he understands. He said that teachers are their best advocates. Mm -hmm. They're the best ones to advocate for them. But then he said, in the same breath, he said that I wish that, you know, less teachers would go. You know, some <laughs> teachers would just carry the torch, and the majority of the teachers would stay behind. But he understands 
what teachers have to do because they have to yeah. fight for themselves the if super, they want their yeah. conditions to be better. The superintendent would like to see pay raises as well, um, but again, he's got a system to run, and I think there was a day and time when teachers walking off the job would have been looked down upon by the public right. in general. But, you know, with the, you know, the walkouts that we've seen among students for, um, for gun control and the general success of those walkouts in West Virginia and Arizona and other places, I think there's, I think there's a dynamic right now that's going on that yeah. kind of makes it acceptable and maybe effective. It's populism in another form, right? right. I mean, it's where people are making their statements and, and making their voices heard. Right after uh, President Trump's inauguration, you had the women's movement uh, you know, a lot of people took off work and went up and, and, and did that, and, and it's sort of become the way our mm -hmm. democracy um, it works, but that's, that's how people make their statements. And if you think about it, a picture mm -hmm. speaks a thousand words, so if you have a thousand plus teachers showing about the state house, you know, doorstep, yeah. That says a lot. You can write a lot of letters, but having those same letter writers standing on the, right. on the, 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 the state legislature steps is, is another way yeah. to get your message across, and certainly a better way to get your message out to the public. So, uh, And they say there is a strategy. You know, in the morning, they're going to march for students, and then in the afternoon, they're going to go office to office to office and lawmakers and knock on their doors and say, hey, this is, yeah. you know, what we want. These are our yeah. concerns. With so. cameras in tow, with <laughs> reporters exactly. following along. And, and, so. and <laughs> don't, you know, don't underestimate. I mean, the, we're in a era of, of imagery and, vi and you know, and video. And, and social media. So all, everything goes exactly. viral. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, those images, as you said, uh, you know, are huge. And yeah. it's an election year. So all these mm -hmm. people that they're going to be lobbying. It's always an election year. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's their election yeah. year. This exactly. Year. Yeah. We're going to come back and talk about those elections in a moment. But while we're talking about schools, let's touch on the ongoing controversy, the argument between CMS and Matthews over whether Matthews should uh, have the opportunity, the right, the, the, the legal uh, opportunity to uh, spend their own tax dollars for charter schools. We heard this argument last week. We talked about it last week. This week, CMS actually brought parents from Matthews together at a town hall meeting to kind of get their side of the story, CMS's side of the story, to the parents and hear back from the parents in terms of what they think. Um, any surprises, anything that came out of that town hall meeting that, that, uh, from the parents or CMS that surprised anybody? Well, I think CMS is, is, is feeling that the majority of the parents are on their side. Right. That majority of the parents are saying that we are not for, you know, HB um, 514. I think more than 100 parents mm -hmm. showed up. Uh, more than 50 questions were asked of the school board. They took the questions one by one and they answered it. And since last week, more towns are trying to sign up on HB 14. Huntersville, it's on right. Huntersville agenda mm -hmm. on Monday. And I talked to the town of Cornelius, the mayor there, he's for it and it may come on their agenda on Monday. This is exactly what CMS is afraid of or was afraid of from the beginning that what started as a local bill or something that just uh, Mint Hill and Matthews were asking for suddenly would become uh, something that every town that has a beef with the school system over student assignment or busing or overcrowding, this is their leverage. This is their way to, to get a seat at the table and, and some, some control over you know, their school's destinies, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. And CMS, yeah they're, they're scratching their heads because the, the towns who want to create their own charter school district, CMS is saying that you have some of the best schools <laughs> in the area. Your schools have yeah. all the AP courses while a Harding only has five and your schools in your area have 20 and 30 and you, you, know, you have effective teachers there. So, you know, CMS officials, they're scratching their heads, you know, what more do you want? I suppose it's what you have versus what they, they might lose or they, what they will or won't have in the future. That's kind of what they're hedging future bets. By the way, the compromise. There was a, an offer of a compromise between one school board member that represents Matthews and one of the town board members of Matthews. Uh, anyone want to talk a little bit about that compromise and the possibility of it actually working as a, as a way to solve this? We'll see. It was like a five-point compromise yeah. where the town of Matthews said they would pull their support from House Bill 514 and then back another, I think it's a bond that would give more money for construction. In exchange, they would say, hey, if CMS promises to, you know, build a new school in 10 years, fix up some of these trailers in five years, but there was one sticking point. They also wanted the authority to approve student assignment changes within Matthews. And Mayor McCray was like, whoa, let's, let's back off real quick because she said that is something the school board legally has to do. And when I talked to John Urban, he's the commissioner from Matthews who kind of helped with that um, compromise. He said that wasn't his intent to step over CMS. It was more how can they just have a bigger voice when it comes to student assignment changes in Matthews. So we'll see. I know the two who proposed that, um, 
um, Commissioner Urban and then Sean Strain, Strain, excuse me, said, hey, you know, we talked to everybody, but Mayor McCray said we didn't know about this. So mm -hmm. it's one of those, yeah. how much did people know right. ahead of time or know but, ahead right. of time? But it also would, would suggest that, you know, may, maybe there is a lack of, you know, there, there still isn't this commitment, right, in Matthews to, to we're going our own way. Uh, there, there may be room for for, for a middle ground. Yeah. Right? And you know, because of that sticking point, you know, I talked to D. Rankin, he's the education chair of the Black Political Caucus, mm -hmm. and because Matthews Town Commissioners wanted to have a say in student assignment, which is illegal, you know, he said that this shows that this has nothing to do but politics, privilege, and power. That Matthews Town Commissioners, they want to have power to do this. So that's what he believes that mm -hmm. House Bill 514 is all about, power, and it, politics, yeah. and privilege. And as Jim that. mentioned, this bill is, uh, I mean, these lawmakers who will decide on the fate of that bill are all up for re-election this year, so that could mm -hmm. ultimately be something that uh, influences how they vote and, and how they're seen by their constituents, I yeah. suppose. And we heard that same kind of message from school board members the week before saying, you know, this is about power, it's not about the kids, which right. is ultimately yeah. what their job about is control. about. Yeah. So we'll see. It's also maybe just an insurance policy. Yeah. So we'll see if that gets uh, cashed in or not. <laughs> yeah, let's qu talk quickly just about the RNC before we move to the election. Um, uh, apparently we did a really nice job pitching Charlotte as the possible location for the 2020 Republican uh, National Convention. The most fascinating part of the, about this story is the list of cities we're not competing against. Orlando, Dallas, Phoenix, Denver, Atlanta, Nashville, Columbus, Philadelphia, and Pittsburgh. Those are, that, that's usually our Shelby, competition Shelby in almost every, you know, <laughs> almost every, you know, uh, thing we, we yeah. want, every big event, and they're all the ones that don't want the Republican National Convention this year. Does that maybe clear the way or at least open Makes a path it easier, for us right? to, you yeah. know, bring another convention to town in two years? Listen, we're a purple state, right? And and this is, the, I, I think the Republicans have to be looking at Charlotte seriously as, as, a, as a, 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 a possibility, right? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know that we have a, a, a clear path to the convention. Yeah. I don't think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's done and over with yet, right. but, you know, I think we do have a, a, a good shot at it. I mean, I think you'd have to recognize that. Look how much Charlotte's changed even since the 2012, since the Democrats were here. We have a lot more hotel rooms, a lot more amenities. It's, you know, as, as Mark said, it's a purple state. <coughs> uh, President Trump carried it last time, mm -hmm. and so you got to think it's an attractive place. You think it's fair to say that because it's Trump's convention, President Trump's convention, that that's why some of these cities aren't as interested yes. as they might otherwise be if it were another candidate or the Democratic National Convention? I, I, I think so. I mean, I think there was probably some perception, and, and you ran off the list. I know some of those are, you know, like Charlotte, predominantly a Democratic city in a Republican state, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Take Atlanta, you know, right off the top. Uh, you know, if you're the mayor or... Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think and we'll, I read, uh, go ahead. I read this morning sure. that um, that Las Vegas also uh, may be top of the list of having the convention as well because, you know, you have the Trump Hotel there and everything <laughs> like that. So, you know, people were saying that Las Vegas, and I guess one of the chair of the Republican, you know, is from Nevada. Yeah. So, so Las Vegas may come there, emerge yeah. as a top city as well. Yeah, and for a second we thought yeah. San Antonio might have been a contender, but this past week their city council met and said, you know what, thanks, yeah. but no thanks, Once we're again, gonna pass. How do you say no to all that, well, you know, to all that, all those visitors, all those dollars, all that exactly that uh, focus and, and media attention? Somebody needs to start a Trump well. hotel here. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, also, it's a lot of money. <laughs> Rebranding, right? They, they can play yeah. golf down there. But <laughs> again, <laughs> we all, uh, most of us, I think, went through the 2012 uh, convention, and by and large, it went great, right? <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. But oh my goodness, there was a lot of preparation, a lot yeah. of planning, a lot of money preparing for yeah. potential pro protests and so forth. Yeah. They were minimal at best. This yeah. would be significantly different. Yeah, exactly. uh, the the, the uh, political temperature is boiling and will continue yeah. to go up. And, and so it could be you know, I can also see why a lot of cities would not want to get involved for that reason. Yeah. And it's just interesting how our Democratic mayor, that she traveled to D.C. and she's lobbying and she wants, you know, yeah. the RNC to mm -hmm. come here. So, you know, so well, bipartisan. Is, yeah. Also, Duke is, is putting up some money to um, to have the RNC here yeah. as well. Yeah. So. It's good for business. We'll see if it's, uh, we'll see if Charlotte survives uh, the shortened <laughs> list of competitors and uh, what kind of convention we might have in 2020 compared unconventional. to... Unconventional. Yeah, an unconventional yes. convention. Well Can't wait to see what Off the Record is going to look like on <laughs> that week. Of, uh, <laughs> be off the rails. Off the, the, <laughs> off the off rails. The chain, yeah. Off the rails. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy, I see it. I see it. <laughs> We're coming up with new names for the show as we speak. Hey, let's talk about the election. Um, a lot of 
interesting races this year, a lot of competitive primary races for a change, none more competitive, I, I guess, than the 9th District congressional race, uh, particularly among the Republicans, Robert Pittenger, the incumbent, Mark Harris, back for another round against him, and Clarence Goins, who's from down east, another significant part of that um, of that district. Uh, Jim, you, you got your you got your uh, diagnosis out yet, or your you know, I, <laughs> Dr. Moore, weather it's, vane? It's yeah. always hard to say. I would expect a, a Congressman Pittenger to to win this, frankly, but. I don't think that you're going to see the margins that the, a couple polls have suggested. You know, a couple polls came out, uh, Civitas being one uh, uh, last month that showed him with a 30-point lead. I don't think it's going to be that big a lead for sure. Uh, and it really all depends on turnout, like all elections do. But you've seen a lot more turnout, a lot heavier early voting turnout in Union County, um, which uh, Mark Harris did better in last uh, mm -hmm. time. Mark Harris, remember, only lost to Pittenger in 134 2016. votes, something 134 like votes. So, you know, it could be a lot closer than polls suggest for sure. Yeah, it's it's certainly nasty. They certainly um, yeah. are, you know, in flyers and I mean, you don't see much in commercials. But if you get mail like I do, you get a lot of things from both sides. Harris and uh, Pittenger have been sending out things that point out. You know, they're the real Trump supporter. My opponent really isn't the Trump supporter. What did uh, Mark Harris call uh, Pittenger allergic? Uh, that's him right now, probably oh. calling, asking why we're talking <laughs> I'm about so it. Sorry. Say something nice, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, call you back. Yes, uh, just uh, <laughs> talking about him being allergic to the truth. I guess was the uh, was the line he used. But this is, I mean, there's there's no there's a second time around. There, it's no less nasty, no less competitive, no less. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I guess. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a passionate race on both sides. I think it's going to be interesting, just to, uh, on that note, to see how much of that bad blood carries over into the fall, because whoever wins that primary is likely going to have a strong Democratic challenger right. in Dan McCready, who's very likely going to win his primary in the 9th District, and he's got more money than, than either candidate, than any candidate so far. And if if there's a split in the Republican Party because of the primary, that's going to carry over. Listen, yeah. I, I, I would strongly suspect that whoever wins or whoever loses, maybe is a better way to put it, those folks aren't going to run over and, and register as Democrats or vote as Democrats. Uh, yeah. I, I think for all intents and purposes, I don't want to write McCready off, but I, I think this is viewed as stay the home. election. Yeah, they he, could stay home. And he's a well-funded, he's a moderate Democrat, he's an ex-Marine, he, you know, he plays a lot of ways some of the successful Democrats in other districts around the country have, have mm -hmm. played. And I'm surprised to see the 9th District on some lists of flippable uh, races this year. I mean, it's just, we haven't had a, a close race, Democrat versus Republican, since, what, D.G. Martin versus Alec McMillan back in the 80s. And so, and, and now I'm really now, reaching back into the, yeah. the history books there. But, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, I don't, you know, is this a year where the Democrats could really, you know, make a run of it? Well, you know, we'll find out. But uh, a weekend Republican uh, nominee because of the primary certainly would make it easier for the Democrats, I suppose. Well, yeah. and there's a lot that can happen between now and November, right? Yeah. Whoever wins uh, next week, uh, he's got a lot of time, and politically, nationally, locally, a lot of stuff can yeah. happen. By the way, I want to point out that uh, if, if you are allergic to the truth, this is the allergy season. So this <laughs> take, so, take something for that and you'll feel a lot better. Um, uh, the, 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 uh, the sheriff's race is also something that we, you know, we've talked about in the context of the last couple of weeks of uh, the, the 287G program. It's emerged as, a, as, as the, the one issue maybe that's talked about more than any, but the, I guess the question is, is that the kind of an issue that can, that can knock off an incumbent like Erwin Carmichael? Uh, I think if he had a single contender, mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. could. Yeah. But with Ensley and uh, Gary McFadden, both African-American running in the primary against him, in, we've already seen a split. You know, there the NAACP is, is, is really supporting Ensley, where I believe the Black Political Caucus endorsed McFadden. McFadden. Mm -hmm. and, and there's some bad blood there. Uh, the, and so I, I frankly see those two almost splitting the vote and uh, probably opening the door for Carmichael. Well, you know, uh, Kirsten brought up a point earlier, too, that there's a new threshold this year. Right. That, um, uh, the legislature changed the law last year. It used to be you had to have 40 percent or more to avoid a runoff. Mm -hmm. This year you only need 30 percent to avoid a runoff. And in, in a three-person race, just do the math, yeah. and somebody's going to get 30 percent. It's not so, hard to get to 30 percent in a three-person right. race. Right. If there were, uh, if there were a, a runoff, a, a 40 percent threshold, 
it'd be more likely that there right. would be a runoff in this race, but now probably not. Yeah. And I guess it all depends on voter turnout, and they are really pushing those three um, 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 items, you know, solitary confinement mm -hmm. for teenagers, the 287, and the change in how you can mm -hmm. visit an inmate, that no more in person, you have yeah. to, you know, go online. And people are really pushing those three yeah. issues to vote against Irwin Carmichael, yeah. and then, you know, that can split the vote because those other two, Inslee and McFadden, they have come out against those three things that Irwin supports. Let's remind people what 287G is. That's the program that the jail has now that the sheriff supports that allows the, the jail to, uh, to red flag, if you will, uh, uh, people that are brought in and processed for crimes that also have questions about their, uh, about their immigration status. And in many cases, the Sheriff's Department is working with ICE and federal officials to, 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 to begin the process of deportation in some of these cases. That's an issue that obviously hits home and, and, and strikes a chord in the, uh, in the Latino community. But, uh, Kristen, uh, I heard you on the radio this week talking about how little effect in the past that the Latino voters have had in, in elections like this. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to get, at least historically, hard to get local uh, Latino voters out to vote in a local election like this. That's right, and it's a national and a local trend where Hispanics are growing in terms of just population in states like North Carolina, and they're growing as a voting block, but they don't show up to the polls. So mm -hmm. we'll see what happens on, no, on, excuse me, on May 8th. I know I talked with some activists who said, you know, we're in the community more, we have done forums in the community, and they're hoping that will help Latino voters say, okay, this is my time to cast my ballot. So time will only tell what will happen, but I know we have nearly 30,000 registered Hispanic voters in Mecklenburg County alone. So even just a small portion of them come out, we'll see if that makes a difference. But we have noticed in the past that Hispanic voters aren't necessarily voting for something, they're voting against something. So, yeah. you know, the question is, will they be voting against 287G or will they be voting for, you know, a Gary McFadden or mm -hmm. Antoine Inslee? I'm not sure, but for the Hispanic community, 287G is definitely their election issue. You know, it's kind of surprising to me that 287G, which was started by Jim Pendergraf, mm -hmm. former sheriff, mm -hmm. in 2006, it hasn't been an issue in sheriff's yeah. races until now. I mean, we've had two or three before, yeah. two or three elections before this, and it hasn't come up that much. Erwin Carmichael inherited the program. He yeah. wholly endorses it, and we heard a couple of weeks ago that the even the police chief publicly came out against the program, program seeing it as, I guess, an obstacle to community policing and reaching out to the Latino community. The question I have is, will other Democrats, non-Latino voters, rank-and-file Democrats, black Democrats, will they embrace that as an issue because it has been, you know, it, it's been uh, kind of a centerpiece of the campaigns of both uh, Ainsley and um, and uh, Gary McFadden, and and yet I'm not sure it's the kind of issue that that moves the needle in a race like this. I mean, huh? well, I think everybody brings their own reasons to vote, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you talk about the, the the numbers of people. I I think it's obviously a Latino uh, concern, and and there will be some others who view it as a concern, uh, but people will probably have other reasons that they would pull a lever for one of those three candidates yeah. uh, personally. Uh, I, I don't see it as the overriding issue for many other constituencies. Yeah. In, a, in a race without, I guess, major issues, maybe, you know, it's, it's an opportunity to single out something and, and maybe, you know, yeah. you know, work that issue as a possible needle mover. I just, again, there's no history to show that it's an effective issue in this, in this community. We'll find out if it's... I think you, you look know, at the people forward. who vote in a Democratic primary, though, which, who are predominantly Democrats, some unaffiliated, and Sheriff Carmichael, I think, hopes that a lot of unaffiliated vote in this mm -hmm. and, and vote for him, but I think a lot of uh, Democrats who, by and large, are maybe more progressive who vote in primaries, are, this will be an issue for them, and yeah. it uh, won't be to the sheriff's advantage necessarily. Yeah. Immigration has moved forward as a national issue. Right. We'll find mm -hmm. out if it's about to move forward as a local issue as well. Um, that's a winner-take-all race, by the way. There is no Republican running for sheriff this year. Also no Republican running for uh, district attorney. We've got two Democrats, interesting campaign. The uh, incumbent uh, Mecklenburg DA is Spencer Merriweather, who has never won an election but was appointed by the outgoing Republican DA to take his place when uh, he became the, uh, the the federal prosecutor, running against Toussaint Romaine, who we all saw over and over again during the protests in 2016, acting as sort of a peacemaker between the police and the protesters. Uh, any any sense of where that race is headed? Um, uh, you know, given the you know the you know the, the protest uh, influence on that, and the general sense that the DA's office, in many ways 
according to opponents, is viewed as a rubber stamp in some ways for the police department and some of the problems that, that people see there. Well, I think you have to think about what kind of reform you're looking for. Both candidates say they want to reform the criminal justice system. Both of them are African-American men. So whoever wins, they, they will make some kind of history in Charlotte because mm -hmm. we've never had an African-American district attorney at least one, win an election. Obviously, right. Meriwether became the first with his appointment. But I think it's what kind of reform do you want to see in your community? That's, I think, going to move the needle here. Meriwether is definitely the party favorite. Uh, he's gotten a lot of endorsements, and I think you see a lot of Democrats, black and white, really supporting him. Mm -hmm. Toussaint Romaine is on a different side of reform. He definitely is someone who came from the public defense side, now wanting to run the DA's office. He says he may have come to, people might know him now because of the protests, but he doesn't want that to be his only thing people know him for. You know, he has 10 years in the game in the public defense side, right. so it'll be interesting to see how he brings that experience to voters this year. Yeah. And, it, and it turns into a race between the insider and the outsider again, much mm -hmm. like the sheriff's races. Exactly, and it's also, you know, perception, because even though Meriwether didn't, when, didn't um, this is his first time running for district attorney? He's already district attorney, so people may think of him as the incumbent, right. which you know, which and, is and, exactly. So people a, say, well, yeah. he's already in office, everything yeah. is going well. In so a, you know, yeah, I'm not in just leaving things in a low as they turnout, are. Uh, a primary, a right, winner exactly. take all. That that and could he be has the, the deciding, name recognition. You know, people that could already, be the deciding so, factor. Well, exactly. you know, we're out of time. Uh, oh, uh, next week, <laughs> uh, next week we'll find out. You know, who's right and who's wrong. But for now, at least, thank you all for joining us this week to talk about the upcoming election elections and uh, schools, which always seem to be a, an issue here. Thank you for joining us and listening in as well, and we'll see you next time on uh, Off the Record. A production of PBS Charlotte.